Welcome to the Living Your Greatness podcast. I am your host, Ben Mummy. The purpose of the podcast is to inspire millions of people across the world to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. Living Your Greatness is becoming the go-to resource that CEOs, elite athletes, professional coaches, and entrepreneurs rely on to upgrade themselves. The podcast helps you master the best of what other people have already figured out. So I gladly invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy tuning in to today's episode. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy. And today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Ronnie Stofferle. So for those of you that don't know Ronnie, he is a managing partner and fund manager of Incrementum AG, where he manages a fund that invests based on the principles of Austrian School of Economics. So Ronnie, without further ado, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you with us today. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me. It's a great, great pleasure. So Ronnie, let's kind of get kicking here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, where did you spend your formative years growing up and what inspired you, you know, to become a managing partner as well as fund manager? Well, I'm I'm 42 years old. Um, as we know, 42 is the answer to everything. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm originally from from Vienna. I have to say, it's I, I traveled all over the globe, but I think uh, Vienna is is really one of the best places to to be. Um, it's um, it used to be the the capital of a huge empire, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, more than 40 million people living in this empire. It used to be the uh, I would say the intellectual capital of the world, and you can still feel this um, this greatness and this uh, uh, Im- Im- imperial feeling when you're uh, strolling around Vienna. So, so if you haven't been to Vienna yet, um, come over. It's it's a fantastic place. So I I grew up here uh, in Vienna. Um, my dad uh, he's he's running a small business um, as a as a as a consultant. Um, and um, for me, it's it has always been kind of clear that I want to set up my own business because I, I I felt like you know when when the weather is was fine, my dad said, well, you know, let's play tennis uh, in the afternoon, and I can work at night. And this was before you know um, you know home office and stuff like that. So so this flexibility, um, this was something that I that I always wanted to have in my work life and for him he always said you know being being swabian and and they're very very famous for you know their their worth as work ethics but also it's called schaffe schaffe häusle bauer which means um uh, Arbeit, uh work work and 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 build a home um so so saving from for 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 the swabians is something very very important investing is very important um hard work is important and i think that's that's something that that he always um uh showed me um during my formative years um i went to 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 um uh, to a Catholic uh, high school, but then went to a kind of a commercial college um, where I learned about, you know, economics, about accounting and stuff like that. And um, bought my first stocks when I was like 13 or 14. Um, and I got completely hooked. So so I started investing in, in IPOs, um, did lots of um, fundamental analysis. And then the dot com boom came and and i was uh in my in my final final class um uh close to graduating and and my whole my whole class in school was invested in all those uh weird um dot com names <laughs> and <laughs> we all made lots of money lots of money and 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 i remember well i wanted to buy a ferrari uh for my graduation day um, but after the dot com boom came the dot com bust, and uh, I didn't drive with my with my Ferrari. I, you know, I don't know if you remember um, Magnum PA, this TV show, um, where he drove a, a Ferrari, I think a Testarossa. So that was always my my idol um, with his uh, uh, nice mustache. Uh, you have to look him up, yeah? Magnum. He was he was an an idol of the nineteen eighties. Um, so dot com boom became the dot com bust. Uh, everybody was 
um, pretty frustrated. Uh, I had to go to school by bus again. And uh, it taught me a big lesson, a big, big lesson of, um, you know, managing risk um, uh, about sentiment in, in, in markets. And uh, yeah, then I went to, to the university, learned nothing about investing, but always worked uh, part time in a bank uh, uh, on the trading desk of a, of a, of a bank. I, I started writing. Um, um, for a financial newspaper, I always read, you know, two or three books per per month. So I tried to 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 grow, and uh, yeah. Then after graduating from 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 university, um, started as an analyst in a bank, and um, invested in this junior gold mining company that did tremendously well. That became a forty bagger. Or Cisco Exploration, and I didn't have a clue about gold. And I, I went to my boss, who was really a great guy, great mentor, and asked him, you know, Fritz, um, I've got this gold mining company, and I'm getting interested into the topic of gold. Could you, you know, w w would I be able or allowed to work on the weekends on a special report on gold? And he said, yeah, go ahead. And that got me started. And I didn't have a clue that 17 years later, I would be publishing, you know, the most widely followed publication on gold. And I didn't have a clue that gold would continue to fascinate me and that there would be, you know, so much going on in the world. And that this basically this moment um, was pretty decisive for my for my future career. I appreciate you, you know, Ronnie, you know, for giving that whole background of who you are. I love how you started with, you know, the mentor of your father and how he taught you about hard work and, and then also, you know, shifting to, you know, your discovery over time, you know, of gold, as well as a gold mining company and like the success that that brought to get more attention. The biggest thing too, that you also mentioned was, you know, your understanding of Austrian school of economics. So, you know, a question that I want to kind of dig a little deeper here is, you know, what are the principles of Austrian School of Economics and how do they differ, you know, from other types of economics out there? Well, first of all, I, I have to say that, um, unfortunately, the Austrian School of Economics is not really big at all in Austria. Uh, it's it's pretty much the, uh, the the opposite. So so even though I, I, I started business administration and economics here, um, I never learned anything about, you know, the, the theories of Ludwig von Mises, uh, Hayek, uh, Bimbawerk, Menge, and so on, um, which is um, which is a bit saddening. But but we try to to create some sort of a renaissance for for the Austrian school of economics uh, through our writing and you know um, through you know educating people about the Austrian school. Um, now, you know. The, the, the principles of the Austrian School of Economics. I think it's, it's if if you want to put it in a nutshell, I would say it's it's common sense economics. It's the the no free lunch school of economics. And you know the Austrians they say, for, first of all, uh, you know every action has has a consequence. So this causality is very important. Uh, the Austrians say that human actions are are purposeful. Um, so, so this means that that man can use to achieve his goals um, uh, are basically limited by the scarcity of resources. Scarcity, scarcity is a very, very important uh, topic. Um, the Austrians always emphasize that the future is um, is uncertain. Um, the, the 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 subjective value theory is extremely important you know what's what's the value of a picasso painting um it's highly subjective then of course we've got um uh, uh marginalism uh so this declining marginal utility the best example of course is you know if uh, what what's a glass of or a bottle of water worth um when you um uh, are in the desert and and you didn't drink anything for two days uh, well, the first bottle is obviously, you know, it's uh, it's worth basically everything. Yeah, the second one probably a little bit less, and the tenth bottle of water will be far less than the first one. So, so this marginal um, 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 utility is 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 very very important. Um, when it comes to 
to the differences between the Austrian school and the mainstream, I think it it begins at the the most fundamental level. It's it's the the, the method first of all. It's logic versus uh, empiricism, and then um, especially I would say the goal of economic science, which is understanding versus prediction, and and the Austrian approach is 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 always focusing on really understanding the the real world cause and the real world effect so the mainstream on the other hand tries to predict human behavior and macro level um phenomena uh, using mathematical models and um one 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 very important um um uh, example that that Ludwig von Mises gave um uh, uh, in his class to show the difference between the two um ways of 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 explaining human behavior was to observe um, people at the Grand Central Station in New York during rush hour, where he said the objective and the truly scientific behaviorist, um, he he would skewer what would, would observe basically empirical events. Um, you know, for example, people rushing back and forth aimlessly at, at certain predictable times of the day. Um, and that is basically all that he would know. But the true student of human action would start from the fact that human behavior is, is purposeful. And he would see that the purpose is, you know, to go to work from home in the morning, to go to school and basically the opposite at night. So, it is obvious which of the two would basically discover and know more about human behavior and therefore which one would be the genuine scientist. And I think it's 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 really important to to always also distinguish. Um, you know, nowadays econom nowadays economists are they're operating in a very, very narrow field. So they are they're extremely focused in their work. While um the Austrian economists, you know, they 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 were very well read, you know, in history. Um, Ludwig von Mises once said that the economist is the historian of the future. Um Austrian economists, in, in, they, they, they learned about, you know, social sciences, uh, about law. And for, do, for them, economic principles were only just one part of their, of their studies. And then one last thing, Ben, I would say that nowadays the Austrian school differs from, from other schools of economics in that sense that it is not government propaganda. So, so um, you know, Austrian economics is really free market, um, libertarian um, 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 uh, economic theory, while basically for 99.9% for .9 of all economists, it's, total, uh, it, 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 it's totally clear that um, governments and central banks always have to intervene, that they have to um, manage markets, while the Austrian school would say, no, let the market work it out. So those are the, 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 the main differences. Um, I have to say I'm, 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 I'm not a, a scholar of the Austrian school of economics. I read a lot. I, I try to understand everything. For an investor, I think it's, it's very, very, um, it adds to your toolbox but um, I have to say, you know, knowing about the Austrian school, it doesn't necessarily make you a better investor. I love that. Well, thanks for giving an explanation of it. The next thing that I want to kind of shift to you is you're really known for writing like the gold we trust report, right? You do this every year. Question that I want to ask you is, you know, a lot has gone on since 2023. Could you provide some insights of the current state of the gold market and factors that's maybe driving its price? Um, well, well, what's happening? <laughs> so much going on. I would say that you know, gold is gold is just fine at the moment. Uh, I think we have to manage our expectations, and 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 gold is not gold's job. Its its role is not to make you rich quickly. Um, gold's job is to to protect your purchasing power. Um, gold's job is to um, to safeguard capital um, in, let's say, kind of turbulent times. In times when when hyperinflation and 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 currency reforms are are possible. In times when you know we might be moving from one currency system to another. And I think you know that's 
um uh, ben your 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 canadian and 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 when i when i talk to americans for example i i always feel that the major difference is um that um americans per definition are often scared by the the great depression and 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 they're kind of um also the central bank's behavior is very much influenced by the fear of deflation while over here in 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 europe especially germany austria we're still very much influenced by um by the hyperinflation in the 1920s so although that's that's already more than 100 years ago i i i uh, it might sound a bit esoteric but i'm talking about the the monetary dna um, which basically um, describes, um, you know, little little precious moments where we, for example, from our grandparents, got little gold coins. Um, when they talked um, to us about, you know, how they lost everything uh, 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 over the World War, uh, uh, over the hyperinflation, over, um, I don't know, uh, all those currency reforms that they lived through. And uh, I think uh, my my grandfather he he experienced four different four or five different currencies, including the euro. And through every currency reform, he he lost. Um, but if you have gold, um, that definitely it kind of smooths your your purchasing power and it protects your purchasing power um, for those volatile uh, times. Now, I think. For the time being, I would say that 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 gold is, as I've said, it, it's 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 doing just okay. Last year, 2022 was a was a brutal year for for a balanced portfolio. It was basically the first year, I think, um, since 1947, something like that, when not only the equity side but also the bond side was down double digits. So it was really for a balanced portfolio. It it it, it was a you know the double whammy. Um, so gold in dollar terms last year it was basically flat, but in euro terms, for example, gold was up six percent. Uh, in other major currencies, a Brit British pound, for example, gold was up twelve percent. So actually, gold is trading pretty close to to its all time highs um, in most currencies. Uh, however, I think it's important to change the perspective. It's not the price of gold that is close to all-time highs. It's rather the purchasing power of the euro, of the dollar, of the British pound, of the Japanese yen that is measured in gold at all-time lows. So you need more units of dollars, of euros, whatever, to buy one unit of gold. Um, I think that is really, really important. It's not the price of gold rising. It's rather the purchasing power of fiat money falling. Now, um, what, what I see uh, as a scenario coming up for the next couple of, of, of weeks or months is probably that the Federal Reserve and central banks in general will have to pivot. Um, I think a recession is, um, is clearly building, probably end of Q3, beginning of Q4, something like that. I think uh, a recession will become the main um, driver for, for financial markets. And and I think that you know if you analyze uh, the performance of gold during recessions, you can tell that well, gold is actually a pretty pretty good recession hedge. Um, why? Because usually um, when a recession hits, um, it, it's not a laissez-faire approach, the Austrian approach by governments and central banks saying, okay, let uh, let the crisis happen, let the the misallocations of 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 capital. Um, uh, uh, just, 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 just being, uh, um, you know, cleared. Uh, no, it's highly interventionist, and it's getting more and more in interventionist. So we should expect more fiscal stimulus, more monetary stimulus, and therefore, my my game plan for the next couple of weeks is um, a recession. Recessionary clouds will get darker and darker. And then at some point, the Fed will have to panic and reverse uh, uh, its policy, um, which has been the most aggressive rate hike cycle in the last 40 years. Uh, we should should not forget that. And I think this will be the scenario when gold really, really um, uh, takes off. I appreciate that answer, Ronnie, just because the whole purpose, right, is really to protect your wealth, right? Even if you think in the last, you know, three years, like, people's purchasing power and wealth has been protected. 
you know, if things continue to go, you know, what your thesis there, you know, that you, you've explained, you know, showcases that, you know, it's just a matter of time, but what are three different types, you know, of ways that they should have gold, you know, in their portfolio? First of all, gold is not a religion. Gold is not the uh, the solution to every problem. It's not the the answer to every to every question. Um, I think gold sometimes is being advertised as you know um, some sort of a, a religion and 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 you know something that that is very very emotional. Um, I mean, let's face it. When it comes to the topic of gold, but also to the topic of Bitcoin, everybody has an opinion or everybody thinks that he has to have an opinion um while when it comes to convertible bonds or commercial real estate well you don't see this emo- emotional uh, uh roller coaster and this this highly um emotional discussion so it is something special definitely but from my point of view it is some sort of a monetary insurance um so so i would say gold is not um um, an opponent of of equities being real assets, um, it is rather you know the, the 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 opponent is rather cash holdings in dollars in euros um, in in other currencies. So 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 that's I think important to say. Then I I, I would say that um, the the amount of gold that you should you should own, um, I think that's people always want to have you know a percentage and i say well that's it's 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 uh it's not something that I, that i will do because it's it's it really depends on your age for you being a millennial i would say that um um your allocation to equity should be significantly higher because uh, obviously um you you've got a you've got a different uh, uh um time horizon um for somebody who is, um, you know, not that risk tolerant uh, and and just wants to basically put, protect um, its uh, his capital, gold allocation should probably be higher. But what I can say is that what many banks would tell you, you know, a two percent gold allocation is what we advise from a portfolio point of view. That doesn't make any difference. So I think it should be at least between eight to ten percent, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, that makes sense. But as I've said, it really depends on your preferences, on your age, on your risk tolerance. Um, and also, of course, um, on the on the currency where you are saving in, where you're um, um, earning your money in. Um, so therefore, I always say that, you know, I've, I've, I gave keynotes in, I think, 35 different countries all over the globe. And by far the best questions are always, um, being asked in in Turkey, why? Because um, you know Turkish people are used to to their rubbish currency. They are used to high inflation. So for them, it's just natural to hold gold. For them, it's basically the 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 the, the pillar of their asset allocation. So that's that's really crucial. First of all, then I would say when it comes to how to invest and and what to invest, I I think. You know, let's uh, let let's go physical. I think holding physical gold is something that should be should be advised because um, one of the main um, advantages of gold is that it doesn't have any counterparty risk. It's pure possession, um, similar to 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 Bitcoin, for example. So so if you want to protect against worst case scenarios, you want to limit your your counterparty risk. So um, if you think that the, the world is going under, then I would not advise you to, to buy a gold certificate um, um, issued by a, by a large institutional bank. Um, so buy physical gold, think about how to store it, um, think about um, you know, geographical diversification. That's a very, very big topic. We've got clients that consider, you know, storing their gold, not only in Zurich and Liechtenstein, but also uh, in Dubai, in New Zealand, in the US. That's a big topic. Um, and then I would say it's important to differentiate between, um, let's, so, let's say, safety gold and performance gold. Um, if your motivation of buying gold is, uh, well, you know, 
hedging against worst case scenarios like you know high inflation currency reforms uh, a war whatever then you really should have physical gold uh, you should have it in your own possession um, you should care about how to safely store it but if you want to make performance then of course you can all, all also um, consider gold mining stocks um, you can consider um, you know all sorts of derivatives futures options and so on and for mining stocks for example of course they're they're highly attractive and and we we um, we manage uh, we we buy them for our funds uh, however, they carry equity market risk, of course. They carry um, geological risk. They carry political risk. Um, they carry um, financial risk. You know, now with interest rates being above five percent, cost of capital are significantly higher. So never mix up the the risks, but also the upside of physical gold with the risks and the upside and also the downside um, of mining equities. So, so this would be my, uh, my recommendation in a, in a nutshell. I appreciate that, Ronnie. How would you evaluate if you're looking at your whole portfolio, how would you evaluate, you know, the performance of your investment portfolio and what metrics do you use to measure like the success? I think, you know, first of all, there's this whole set of 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 numbers to 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 measure uh, success, and of course, it's 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 a performance, the absolute performance. It's a relative performance against the benchmark, against the peer group. Um, then, of course, it's the risk adjusted performance. Um, then it's maximum drawdown stuff like that. But I would say it's it's really also about um, you know. What, what we communicate to our investors, what we communicate, what the fund um, uh, is actually doing and how the fund will, will develop in all sorts of different scenarios. And therefore, uh, you know, I always make this analogy because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy about skiing or, or rather, rather snowboarding and, and is really one of my, my, my big passions. And I, I always say, well, well, actually, you know, you can differentiate um, if one is a good skier or not, uh, because uh, when the sun is shining, you know, when you've got fresh powder and you know um, uh, the, the 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 slopes are not too steep, everybody is a good skier. Really, everybody. It's not that it's not that hard. But when it's icy, when it's foggy, uh, when you've got harsh weather conditions, when it's when it's steep, um, then you can really tell if one is a good skier or not. And I think it's pretty similar um, with with investors. So I would say, like in calm markets, uh, it's fairly easy to make a decent performance. But in times like last year, for example, and also in 2020. This is really when 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 we as asset managers uh, thrive, and you know, uh, uh, my fund, the inflation fund, for example, was up eighteen percent last year, and we've got another fund um, managed by my by my uh, colleague Hans was up forty percent, and I think that that's that's really important that that our funds. Um, you know they're basically prepared, and, and all our company is being set up for those times, those harsh times, yeah, when when people can differentiate. Okay, this is a good skier, and this is definitely not a good skier. So, um, therefore, I I think you know when it comes to 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 markets and our view on markets and investing, you know, there's there's basically three types of of people. There's the optimist and there's the pessimist and there's the pragmatic and and i think when it comes to to managing wealth we try everything to try uh, to be in the pragmatic camp so we want to see the world like it is um not like it should be and um you know all change that is 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 going on is is also carrying the seeds of of risk and opportunity so um, you know, it's 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 kind of a hope for the best, uh, prepare for the worst uh, setup, or um, save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist. I think that's that's what we care about, and this is something that I also kind of criticize when it comes to the Austrian school of economics. Um, there's um, especially the 
yeah, I, I would say that the the the, the academics, uh, of course, their 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 job is is not um you know to 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 forecast markets and 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 uh, um, offer solutions. But I think many in the Austrian camp are only seeing the bad things that are going on, and there's quite a lot of that, obviously. But they completely miss many positive aspects, and they're very quick to criticize things um but i think we should offer more solutions and 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 therefore i think you know we as you know austrians but also um you know being asset managers and 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 entrepreneurs for us it's important to to offer um great solutions for for our clients and solutions that we all also invest with our own money because skin in the game is obviously something that that differentiates us as a little boutique also to the to the large players so that was a very long answer to <laughs> to a short question but i hope you yeah i hope it makes sense something that i want to you know kind of pinpoint you know that you brought up is you know the whole analogy there right it, it's easy in a good market obviously to make those decisions to favor the investor right but it, it takes a lot more stomach right to take those pains when things are foggy or lots of noise out there or confusion you know, let's kind of go there. When things are, let's say, in the storm and foggy and confusing, you know, what are some, you know, maybe important questions or quality questions that you ask yourself, you know, to hopefully make better moves or kind of decisions? That's a very, very good question. Um, I think, first of all, the first question should always be, what, what if my assumptions are not right? Um, wh what can go wrong? So really... Um, protect the downside and and you know think in think in scenarios, especially when it comes to 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 um, position sizing, when it comes to to risk management, and then think about start thinking about the upside. And this is something I think that that many people tend to forget. I, I, it's something that that a trader friend of mine uh, told me once. He said, "Well, a really great investment. It has to." It has to give you sleepless nights. It's it's when you when you hit the buy button, um, it shouldn't be too easy. Um, it shouldn't be something where when you go to a cocktail party, where you say, "Well, I bought whatever this this uh, nickel mining stock," and people shouldn't say, "Well, this is a fantastic idea. I also did the same." Probably a little bit like you know. Um, AI stocks at the moment where everybody would say, fantastic, yeah, how can I invest in that? Um, so it has to be some sort of a contrarian idea um, to make it a really, you know, uh, uh, brilliant investment, yeah, something ten, that can go up like 5x, um, something that where you really... Um, try to 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 pick a, a bottom and 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 uh, so so that would be one thing. Then I think the second thing is averaging in. This is also something that that we do in in some of our funds. Um, um, risk um 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 uh, permanent uh, rebalancing of positions. Um, so basically, um, you know, constantly. Uh, buying into um, positions that have that have fallen, if of course um, um, our general assumption is still still accurate, um, and then I think it's also crucial right at the beginning to also consider you know when to sell. Um, what's the scenario for for getting out of the position? Sometimes, uh, I mean those those are not positions that that we trade in our funds. But when it comes to to junior mining stocks, for example, um, you know it's 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 like with uh, with um, you know when you're a criminal, it's it's easy to get into jail, but it's hard to get out, and it's it's easy to get into um, illiquid uh, uh, junior mining stocks, but it's sometimes it's really hard to get out. So so I think that's that's also very very important, and and then I would say, but that's a very general thing is. Um, and that's that's also the the beauty of it. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 like uh, navigating in markets. That's that's like a, a big puzzle, uh, like a three D puzzle that is always changing. And at some point, you think, well, I've got it. Yeah, I I I now completely understand it. And then something changes. And and I think this. 
ah, this dynamic in 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 trying to understand and forecast capital markets and being one step ahead i think that's that's the big fascination that every asset allocator has and 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 that continue to amaze me after you know being in markets like for roughly 30 years i appreciate that like mindset of questions and and how you challenge the narrative i think that's extremely important because we are very emotional as humans right and we are are biased at times right so to always yeah. be challenging always be looking from different angles to make sure that your thought process is correct kind of like you said like it shouldn't be easy you know the buying and like the selling move so there should be a lot more thought so then you hopefully make a more intelligent decision I'm a big believer, you know, in people like Charlie Munger who have developed, you know, a lot of mental models, you know, essentially to help people make better decisions, right? In terms of, you know, investing or business or psychology or life. Mm -hmm. What are some mental models, you know, that you have in your toolkit that you maybe apply to make more intelligent investment decisions? Well, that that's a that's a great question, uh, Ben. I think um, first of all, margin of, of 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 safety is always important. Yeah, you always want to invest with with a certain margin of safety, and, and it's it's kind of a buffer for for uncertain times. Yeah, for for protecting downside, and and also, you know, if if you're wrong in your decision process, um, then I think always invest in stuff that that you truly understand yeah this this circle of competence um i know a friend of mine for example he he loves whiskey and and he goes to uh to scotland every uh you know every quarter basically but it just he has a passion for whiskey um and he um he knows uh, you know the the distilleries well he established relationships and 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 he probably he he showed me kind of the performance of of the whiskey bottles that that he has in his basement and and probably that's better than most of the hedge fund managers yeah so so but he really knows and loves uh what he's investing in and and he doesn't really regard it as an investment i would say it's rather you know he's saving his money in 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 whiskey um so yeah, so, so <laughs> he likes liquidity, obviously. Um, and that's that's the same with you know, passion is something that is really, really important. I, I've got no clue about you know, um, convertible bonds, yeah, uh, about government debt, um, uh, biotech stocks. That's probably really interesting stuff. Uh, stuff biotech stocks, but I just don't have a clue. So so if I wanna allocate some capital in those spaces i go to people that really have a passion for it and you know that's that's the beauty of um being being open and being you know a communicator and 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 just meeting people that you create this circle of competence and 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 i know from you know attending conferences and giving speeches i i met so many brilliant people all over the globe and if i need to know something about vanadium uh, i know whom to call or, or drop an email to so that's that's really uh uh, uh important uh, then i think you know you know some sort of a passion and and and, and love for for, for for market is 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 really important and we all know that mr market can be very very irrational and 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 you needn't always uh kind of uh heed the advice by by mr market and 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 i think that's also the sentiment perspective is is really important and i did a um uh, um i didn't do the cfa i did the cmt the chartered um market technician and and i read so many books about you know um, different patterns, uh, different techniques, and also how to analyze the market structure, the sentiment, um, and that really added quite a lot of new tools to my to my toolbox. Um, opportunity costs, obviously, is something very very important, and I think that's also something that the Austrian School of Economics uh, uh, touches on. So. Um, you know, the time and also the money that is spent on, on one investment is the time and the money that cannot be spent on another investment. Um, I think it's uh, in general, like um, um, concepts like the, the Pareto principle, the 80, 20 rule is, 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 is pretty, pretty important. Then biases like scarcity bias, 
um, recency bias, anchoring bias. Yeah, all those things are are, are really important. Um, and then I think, you know, from a from a mental perspective, I think it's um, this this uh, extreme respect for for the market and 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 market participants and you know um respect for prices and what prices are actually telling us i think that's that's really really um uh, uh, crucial so you know those kind of models or, 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 or um, things are what i would it, it's 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 a great question but but i think and i have to think about it more probably but but those are those are the first things that that come to my mind i really appreciate that ronnie very detailed. You gave a lot of examples of mental models. And I love that you're aware of that because I think uh, more and more investors need to be aware. It just helps them again, try and be a little less emotional, question their decisions to hopefully make better ones. Like I said, you know, my next question I want to go to, what do you think makes a great investor? Love for, 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 for the subject and, and uh, curiosity. I think uh, a very, very, uh, you know, time, time is, is it's, it's all about time, you know. Um, uh, um, I think you, you have to. I, I, I really enjoy running. I mean, at the moment, my, my, my knees are kind of, um, they, they hurt. So I, I didn't run any marathon this year, but, but I love running. And at some point, I realized, well, you know, I, I'm really good when it comes to. To long distance running, this is where where I feel the most comfortable at, and and I'm not a good sprinter. And five um, k, ten k, it's I sometimes do it, but it's 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 tough. But after twenty or thirty k, that's that's where you, really this runner's high sets in. And and I think that as an investor, you also have to know um, if you're a sprinter, if you're a, a you know a, a long term. Uh, um, uh, uh, long distance runner, or, or, or w- what you actually are, and and I think this is a um, a very very important thing. And you know, I will never become a a fantastic sprinter, um, um, but I know that in in my in my age, I'm a I'm a decent long distance uh, a runner, and that I can still improve my performance in that. Um, and I think that's 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 really really important. I have to say, I'm at. And this is also a blessing of 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 of, of my job and my career it's that um, I've met so many so many brilliant people. Before we we talked uh, briefly about uh, Rick Rule, for example, uh, one of the you know the one of the giants of this industry. Not because he's an extremely successful investor, but he's a, just a a great man. And 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 you know I. Uh, I, I watched him once at a, at a at a conference, and he's always the one, the first one to show up and the last one to go. And um, he he wants um, a, a, a kind of a junior uh, colleague of, of 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 us who who did some work for us. Um, he was a a volunteer at a at a mining conference, and he was like a, just a young kid, a student, a, a nobody. And he approached Rick Rule and said, "Yeah, no, Mr. Rule, uh, you know, I'm." Um, I'm just a volunteer here. Um, I would like to talk to you. And I think they sat down for like an hour, and I was so impressed. And 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 I think the um, that's that's what Samuel Johnson once said. It's the true measure of a man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. So as a human being, if you treat you know a waiter, um, if you don't treat him well like somebody who's like your your most interesting business client i think that says quite a lot about uh, uh the personality of people so so this is one of the things that i learned from from many many great investors that they're not only great investors but also great human beings absolutely no i i couldn't agree more with you i think rick rule is a perfect example i was i was telling you too you know before we started this call you know, that I that I was with him last week there in Quebec City at the VIDA conference and just seeing how he was, there was 50 uh, students actually with this student sponsored pro- program and a lot of them it had been their first mining conference. And just to see, you know, how generous he was with his time, you know, taking, you know, an hour or even more and just hanging out, explaining, uh, answering questions, sharing wisdom, right? So something that you mentioned there about the great investors, 
curiosity, you know, Rick Rule definitely shows that passion, definitely demonstrates that. And I think also giving back to others, right? Sharing yeah. that that knowledge, right? So, no, I think I think you highlight some good points and that was a great example. You know, something that I want to shift to, you know, the whole theme of my podcast here, Ronnie, is, you know, to inspire millions of people across the world to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. So what is your definition of greatness? Whew, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I don't really have a, 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 a big definition of greatness. I, I just can tell you, um, um, Ben, that I'm that I'm reading, that I try to 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 read and and to write and to reflect quite a lot, and I've got a, like a, a diary for 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 every year. And what I write on the first page of the diary is um uh, is is by Benjamin Franklin, who said, "Be at war with your vices, at peace with your neighbors, and um let every new year find you a better man." And 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 I think that's. That should be a pretty good definition of, of of greatness that that I try to live by. I mean, I, I don't always succeed, but I but I'm doing my best to 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 grow myself and to to develop as a as an investor, but also as you know as a business owner, as a um, you know as a boss for 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 my employees. They're basically my second family. Um, but also obviously most importantly for, for, for my kids and for my wife. So that's, you know, that's <laughs> quite a lot of things uh, actually to, to, um, to, to do and to, 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 to try to achieve, but, you know, um, we've, you know, just, just doing like small incremental things every day to, to improve yourself. I think that that really adds up over time. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's that would be my my reply to your very very good question. I love that uh, answer. It's being one percent better, as you kind of said, and, and applying that to to everywhere in life, whether that's as a, a boss or a friend or a family man, you know. So I I appreciate that. It says a lot about you. Such a powerful quote there that you quoted. You know, it really showcases who you are as a person of integrity. And so one of my last questions that I want to ask you, Ronnie, is now that you have a good feel of my podcast and kind of what it's all about, who is a future guest that you would like to see on this show? Tony Deedon. Tony, is, um, he's a great friend of mine. He's a, he's a mentor. He's one of the, the brightest investors out there from my point of view. He's, a, he's more of a philosopher than a traditional in, investor. And uh, he did, I can only recommend it. He did a special uh, with uh, Grant Williams when when Grant was still with uh, Real Vision, um, and I think it's it was like a three hour really very very deep conversation. And you know, it's still I think I watched it already three or four times, and I still learn learn from it. Like like I do, for example, with books. I think rereading books that you really enjoy is something very important because you know, first of all you develop and you would probably interpret things differently. And then it's also, if you know something like a good piece of music, if you, if you, if you uh, enjoy an album, you don't just listen to it just once because then you appreciate all the small details, the nuances. And, and that's what I did with this uh, video, with this conversation between Grant Williams and Tony Deaton. So, so Tony might be, really good guest for you but it, he's hard to get he's hard to get <laughs> i love that well thanks so much ronnie and um before we go here you know i want to take this last you know little bit of time here you know to really thank you for making time today on my podcast but you know where can people go you know if they want to follow your work or if they want to reach out to you where's the best place to go well actually um our web page is incrementum.li that's that's for our company incrementum a boutique uh, asset manager based in Liechtenstein. Then we've got um, one web page that is uh, completely focused on the In Gold We Trust report, a report that I'm publishing for, for 17 years now. It's available completely free of charge. More than 400 pages about gold, about geopolitics, about inflation, about the macro world, mining stocks, uh, technical analysis, but also more philosophical things like, you know, discussing the current narratives in the market and so on. Um, I know that not everybody's uh, going to read 400 pages, but I think it's it's well worth. But there's also a compact version of the report. So 
ingoldwetrust.report is the webpage. And then I'm also fairly active on Twitter where I post like charts, um, you know, my thoughts on markets and sometimes, you know, private stuff, you know, when I'm suffering uh, as, as, as my, my football team, my soccer team, uh, Rapid Wien keeps losing. Um, so, <laughs> so that's uh, at Ron Stoefele. That's my Twitter handle. Well, thanks so much, Ronnie. Appreciate uh, the chat today. I'm sure it's added a lot of value to my listeners. Thank you very much, Ben, for having me. Um, thank you for being so persistent. I know it, it took some time to to schedule the the, the interview. Uh, so thanks um, for being that patient. And yeah, I, I greatly enjoyed it. Uh, fantastic questions. And I hope that um, you and your, your viewers, your listeners also uh, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added some value, don't be shy to subscribe, leave a rating, and make a review.